I'm going to run through this presentation and then hopefully there'll be a decent amount of time to answer any questions that anyone has. I think that's um, going to be a good part to get some good insight, you know, personalized to the people that are participating. So, um, but the topics that I've um, come up with for the presentation are going over the simple stuff. What does hack motion measure? Um, some preferences that I might have uh, in uh wrist angles in putting, um, what changes as putts change? Okay, so, uh, you know, one putt isn't the same as another. So what might change in those scenarios? And then what drills and setup pre preferences do I have that can help? Um, so the first thing that we need to understand is that the putting stroke is a sequence of synchronized individual motions. Okay, so, in other words, the human body has 244 approximately degrees of freedom. And with hat motion, we're measuring simply six, right? Three in each wrist. So while the wrists play a vital role in the putting stroke, they are a part of an entire motion. OK, um, so they could be moving in some way as a consequence of something else. Um, so therefore, mostly we can't look at them individually. We must look at the, the global to properly understand the local. So what does hack motion measure? I'm sure most of you should understand this, but um, maybe it's a little bit different with putty. Um, it measures wrist motion, right? We've got flexion and extension, flexion, extension, and then we've got ulnar and radial, uh, ulnar, radial. Right, simple. And then a segment motion, rotation. Okay, so um, as hopefully most of you know, rotation isn't pronation and supination. Okay, pronation, supination. It is um, the rotation as a segment entirely. So flexion extension, common terminology, bowed or cupped. Probably hear that more in the golf swing. Uh, impacts on the putting stroke mostly produces movement in plane. Okay, so if we move our, our wrist flexion extension um, whilst taking our putting grip, it's going to mostly move that putter in plane. It can affect the loft or shaft angle of the putter, and it can affect perhaps indirectly the rotation of the putter. And one way that it can do that is by changing the, the rate of rotation through changing the stroke radius. We've got ulna and radial. Common terminology is hinged, unhinged, cocked, uncocked. And the impacts on the putting stroke is that it mostly produces out of plane motion. Okay, so uh, in the opposite, well, not, maybe not the opposite direction to, um, to flexion extension, but if we have ulnar and radial motion in our putting stroke, it's most likely to produce an out of plane motion. And this affects putter path, strike location, heel or toe, and then again, indirectly face angle. We're going to go more into this later. And then rotation. So again, we go back to this is not pronation, supination. That's part of it, but it's the entire segment rotation. The impacts on the putting stroke mostly affects the rotational plane of the putter. Okay. It affects putter face angle and twisting. Okay. So that is uh, pronation or supination. So I'm going to share some myths in the in the putting stroke, especially when it comes to the wrists. Number one is that the wrists should be locked. You can see see here in this picture of uh, or two pictures of Ben Crenshaw, um, quite a lot of trail wrist extension, um, most likely coupled with a, a little bit of lead wrist um, flexion and possibly ulna in the backstroke. Um, 
yeah, you could even see, you know, from a, from another perspective, rotation, um, that face is wide open at the top of the backstroke. One of the best putters. Um, and it's also worth noting that keeping the wrists locked is basically impossible. I haven't seen uh, any putting stroke achieve uh, zero across the board on the graph uh, for their putting stroke. And another myth is that the pattern should be consistent. I'd say somewhat. So if you're measuring someone hitting the same part over and over again, there should be certainly be some consistencies to what they're doing. Um, but when we vary slopes and distances and green speeds, uh, that means it's okay for someone's, let's say, wrist pattern blueprint to change. So some preferences that I have in the, the putting stroke. My first one would be there should be none or very little opposite or counter movement. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's discuss in relation to flexion extension to start with. So in the backstroke, a golfer will move the putter away from the target or the ball, okay? And when they do that, if they have lead wrist flexion or trail wrist extension, that is moving the sweet spot or the putter head in a kind of harmonious, harmonious way. That's the same direction as the putter is swinging. Okay. If they have the, yeah, there they go. It, it complements the direction of sweet spot swinging. If they have the opposite movement, so lead wrist extension, trail wrist flexion, then they're kind of doing the opposite and it works against what they're trying to achieve, which is ultimately uh, put some energy into the, into the club head. And then going into the downstroke and follow through, again, they, they swing the putter in a direction, right? They're swinging it towards the ball and then after impact, they're swinging it uh, kind of towards the target-ish. Right. So in that respect, um, any lead wrist extension and trail wrist flexion is going to kind of match where the putter is moving. Any lead wrist flexion or trail wrist extension is not going to. OK, that's going to work against what they're trying to do. Uh, a good example of someone that had lead wrist flexion into the ball would be uh, McElroy when he was struggling with his putting a few years back. Um, and when he did some work with Phil, that was one of the main things I think they worked on. You can see the difference now. Uh, much better flow to his stroke. And then talking about transition, some um, in transition is okay. So going, going back to this, lead wrist flexion, uh, trail wrist extension, because you're applying force to the handle, this would probably be more appropriate on a longer putt. Uh, a good example, Stan Utley, very good putter, now very good short game coach. Uh, he would drive the handle a lot um, in transition, especially on a long putt, but then he would use these two to, to kind of match it up at impact. So he wouldn't be de-lofting the putter at impact, that's something we don't want to see. Um, and he would allow the, let's say, the trail wrist to, to flex in the downstroke um, to kind of catch up after this in transition. What else do we want from flexion and extension? Preferably a similar position at setup and impact. Okay, so we want to deliver a similar amount of loft. You can see the example here at impact, delivering maybe one degree, um, depending on what wrist you talk about, one, one degree more, this is the trail wrist, so this is one degree more uh, flexion, um, and that's okay. I prefer, I'd have a preference to someone, a lot of good putters would uh, trend towards adding loft as opposed to uh, de-lofting, and you know, this pattern works towards that. And then not too much movement on a short putt. So let's say six foot and in. Um, 
most of those um, wrist angles are going to stay below that two degrees of change range. Um, and I'd also add to that, I wouldn't want to see any sudden changes in wrist angles as well, uh, especially on a short putt and especially through impact. And then, sorry, this little widget's in the way. Can't quite read it. The, yeah, well, the longer the putt, um, the more lenience there is for movements in the wrist and there's going to be, uh, you know, more flexion extension to help. You have to create leverage, um, speed into the putter for a longer putt, slower green. Um, so flexion extension is going to help that. And that's the main way that you would use the wrist because it's going to produce in-plane forces as we talked about earlier. So here's a, just an example of a shorter putt versus a longer putt. This is me um, hitting the putt and it, it's on my trail wrist. I would say whilst on that point, talking to, talking to the golfer that I'm coaching at the time, I would try and understand if they have a, a dominant hand, dominant side. And I'd say a, a lot of putters are trail side dominant. Um, and there's a lot of good information that you can get from the trail wrist. So I'm certainly trail I'm right-handed, uh, I'm right-hand dominant in the putting stroke. Um, so that measurement is probably more relevant for me. So on a short putt, you can see a little bit of extension in the backstroke um, and then a little bit of flexion coming down. And then you can see more on a longer putt, okay? And you can see actually added a decent amount of loft there, in fact. Um, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily mean there's not a direct correlation between um, an extra three degrees of flexion and impact doesn't mean three degrees more loft because other things that are going to affect that. Um, but you can just see the pattern as a general pattern, uh, more extension going back, more flexion coming down, okay, to create more speed. Let's talk about rotation. Again, I, I don't really want opposite or counter movements in rotation. Um, so again, let's take a right-handed golfer. In the backstroke, they turn clockwise, right, to their right. There'll be different amounts of turn because um, we can move our shoulders, we can tilt or we can turn, and that can vary. But because we turn clockwise, therefore the rotation um, in space should kind of match that. Okay, so the wrist should uh, rotate clockwise in space. And if you turn down, you turn anti-clockwise, uh, counterclockwise if you're um, American. And therefore, we want the same to apply. We want the, the rotation to match that. And again, important to note, this is not twisting, pronation or supination. So if we see no rotation, there can be exceptions on a short part, you might not see a lot of rotation. Or if we definitely, if we see counter rotation, so if that uh, on the graph, um, it's going up in the backstroke and down in the downstroke, um, then it's likely the golf is under twisting, which is not good. Under twisting um, is essentially a rotation of the forearm. So pronation, supination in the opposite direction um, to the body rotation. So uh, if we take the backstroke, that would be uh, pronation of the trail arm or supination of the lead arm, right? Opposite in the downstroke. So it'd be a preference, I'd have a preference to have very little twisting, okay? Supination, pronation. Um, and then again, if there is any, it should complement. So backstroke, um, if we have lead wrist pronation and trail wrist supination a little bit, that's going to be okay. And on a longer putt, again, we'll have more. We'll have more on that in a minute. And then in the downstroke, we'll have lead wrist supination and trail wrist pronation. Um, I would say uh, while we're on the under twisting subject, um, this is why more commonly on tour you'd see if any aim bias, you'd see a right aim bias because it's more natural to, um, to kind of match the rotation coming down. 
if you're aiming left and you don't have a lot of rotation in your backstroke, then you have to under twist. Um, I would say aiming left and accelerating, therefore under twisting with acceleration through impact is probably the, the number one cause I see for someone getting the yips. And then, um, yeah, worth noting as always, uh, these are preferences. So sometimes someone can under twist and it's not always unfunctional. Um, I would say it depends where it is. So under twisting through impact probably isn't ideal. Um, under twisting elsewhere in the stroke could be functional, um, especially if there's not much acceleration at that point in time. So what else do we know about rotation? Well, aim biases and slopes will uh, likely influence the start versus impact position. Okay, so the rotation won't always return to zero. Uh, here's an example of someone who had a right aim bias. So of course they were uh, more rotated um, at impact compared to where they started because they had to um, close the face a little compared to their aim bias. And then the longer the part, the more rotation there should be, okay? Uh, simply matching how the body is moving. So here's an example of that. Short putt. This was approximately 10 feet. Um, I would say I don't have a huge amount of rotation, um, but you can see two degrees of rotation in the backstroke. And then a long putt, you can see about five degrees, and that was 30 feet. So in, in, increasing rotation is going to happen as the puck gets longer, as we need more speed. Talk about ulna and radial. My preference would be for there to be as little as possible. Ulna radial, um, going back to out of plane motion, right? Uh, we don't want to have too much movement out of plane if we can help it um, there's some guys that do that can be functional but generally um, i want to keep those wrists pretty stable in terms of ulnar and radial um, yeah excessive uh, out of plane motion can be difficult to manage um, and especially if it's happening through impact that's that's probably the you know the more important point uh, we don't want too drastic changes for impact and if there is functional changes in ulnar radial, they'll generally happen um, elsewhere in the stroke. Yeah, going again, sometimes it can be functional. Some use ulnar and radial as a, as a means of controlling the face. Interesting one was um, David Angelotti's presentation where he showed uh, data from JT Poston, who um, has quite a lot of uh, ulnar in his stroke just a way of him managing the face. And obviously for him, uh, it was quite functional. Uh, it's kind of on the subject of ulnar radius, radial still, um, worth noting, again, going back to that, we can't look at individual motion or individual movements. Uh, we have to look at as a whole, what's causing things to happen. Uh, we have two hands on the grip. Okay, so producing an isolated movement um, is almost impossible when we move our wrists. Um, plus, if we move our wrists, so let's say we've got both hands on the grip and we, we go into flexion of the lead wrist, it's going to have an impact on what the trail wrist is doing. Okay, and that's not always necessarily, if I, especially depending on where the grip position is, if I go into flexion of the lead wrist it doesn't necessarily mean i'm going to purely extend the trail wrist it can cause other wrist uh, motions too so we're going to try this was this was me uh, i had hack motion on my um just to show you as an example hack motion on my trail wrist and i was simply trying to go into extreme ulna and then into extreme uh, radial without changing flexion extension and you can see that top number is you know changing a reasonable amount um considering i'm doing my best to not do that um so i'd encourage everyone that's uh watching to just have a go at, at moving your wrist 
This is just one hand at a time, moving your wrist up and down and see if you can feel any change in, um, so go ulna, radial, okay? Go ulna, radial, and see if you can, you'll notice your wrist going into flexion or extension. And then try the same again, going flexion, extension. And see if you can notice anything. Oh, playing again. Hold on. Here we go. Um, so before we do this, actually, uh, we're also going to try it. So I want you to put your hands together, almost take your grip in, uh, in midair, right? And then I want you to, I've got the advantage of having my whoop on my wrist, right? If you then, with both hands together, I want you to go try and move your wrists into ulna. And what you should notice, I'm looking at my lead wrist there. So if you look at my whoop, when I do that, I'm supinating. Right? I'm literally trying to push it into ulna. This is where two hands can have a big impact, right? When I do that, I'm supinating as well as flexing when I'm doing that. So that's going back to the point that isolated movements of the wrist are very, very difficult to do. So a couple of examples of what I would see from uh, excessive ulna in the backstroke, probably quite a common thing. Um, as I was showing you there, the lead wrist will go into supination and into flexion, causes an inside and closed backstroke, very common for someone that pulls it. Um, and then this will cause timing issues because they have to allow themselves time um, to get back out to the ball without shutting the face down. And then the opposite, excessive backstroke uh, radial, lead wrist pronation, backstroke outside and open. Probably quite a common one of someone that's trying to uh, take the putter back straight, straight back and through. Never seen it before performed, uh, well, actually never seen it before full stop, but never seen someone trying to do that um, functionally. Um, generally, they'll, they'll either get the sweet spot back online and the face will open more um, because of uh, lead wrist pronation, um, or they will get it inside and hooded. Um, never seen a functional straight back, straight through stroke. So let's talk about some preferences I have that can help with um, more manageable wrist patterns, so to speak. The grip. So I've got a couple of examples there, left below, right below, more conventional. Generally, I'd like to see the hands opposing and the uh, wrist alignment similar. Okay. We'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. So any flexion extension in... Uh, one wrist should produce mostly, I say mostly because again, going back to, um, we're, we're going to find it difficult to find pure flexion extension, um, but it should mostly produce the opposite in the other. Okay. Uh, so not kind of fighting against each other. So you can see it here just to say look, wrist alignments. You can see when you look from down the line, similar amounts of ulnar radial in, in both wrists. Okay, that's kind of a preference. Um, I'd like to see it through the palms. Um, uh, there's a load of exceptions to this rule. It's a, just a, a bit of a preference, uh, especially if someone has like timing issues, um, because getting it through the palm means that any flexion extension in the wrists is going to have less of an impact on uh, face rotation. So if someone produces a different amount of acceleration through impact or different amounts of flexion extension, um, they're going to have a bit more of a stable face. And then I'd like to see some ulna in setup. Um, not too excessive, um, but some ulna to keep the, the wrists a little bit more stable in the stroke. 
So just a way that you can get the, the grip into the correct position. Um, you kind of place your, your hands on both sides of the grip in the prayer position. Then you put your, wrap your fingers around um, however you see fit, and then you can slide your hands um, up or down to wherever feels comfortable. So just to show you a way of, of getting those hands opposing. A lot, of, a lot of players would practice hitting putts to feel, um, let's say, a more stable wrist motion with their hands like this, kind of pushing their palms against each other. That's a drill that I've seen a lot of players do. Talk about arm structure preferences. I prefer to see golfers in um, external rotation of the arms. So again, we're, we're now moving away from um, you know, one wrist affecting the other. Now we're, we're moving into arm, um, elbow joint, shoulder joint affecting how the wrist will move. Um, so I'd rather see a golfer in external rotation um, that set up than the opposite. I'd like to see them keep the orientation of the, the arms pretty similar throughout the stroke. Okay, so how much external rotation they have a set up, the kind of main or in, maintaining that orientation in space, right? So it goes back to there'll, there'll be some rotation of the wrist in space, uh, same with the arm, but the orientation of it relative to the body is staying pretty similar. And we can see the same there in the follow through. And it's not extreme example, but you can see I've set up there with um, some internal rotation um, of the elbow. What that generally encourages is um, the elbows to kind of ride up. Um, I see a lot of golfers kind of putting their arms by their sides to try and pin them to their body. Um, but that puts their arms into internal rotation. And if you think if we extend your arms out in front of you and then if you pull your arm closer and closer by your side this way so arm riding up by your side your wrist will go into extension as well okay so we're going to get changing wrist motions from the, the movement of the arm so you can see in the setup of me on the right here with more internal rotation uh, increased extension in both wrists and increased radial in both wrists as a result of the arm structure. And then one last thing I'd like to see here um, is the radius maintained, so arm length maintained, the amount of elbow bend that I have, um, the shoulder joint kind of staying stable, not moving forwards or backwards. Um, we call that keeping uh, a constant radius in the stroke. So I've got some drills here that you can do to help with uh, arm structure and in motion uh, arm structure. So I've got this guy here, just holding on to any object, a uh, band or a, or a pole, um, and learning to, to keep the arms in front of his body, keep them externally rotated, um, and keep the relationship between the arms and the body pretty constant. So that's one way. That's a good one for um, orientation of the, of the arm in space. Then we've got this one here, sternum stick, good one for uh, radius control, keeping arm length the same. Okay, so elbows not riding up, arms not extending in the, in the backstroke uh, or any point in the stroke, to be fair. Um, you can get those, I've got those, or you've got Eyeline Golf, sell those, um, plenty of options there. And then last of all, we've got the Gravity Fit. There's, I mean, there's, there's loads, there's more stuff, but this is a, a good way for a golfer to, I guess it's a little less strict than something like this, um, but they can feel any changes in tension of the band if there's too, uh, too much excessive change in um, upper body arm structure throughout the stroke. Then I'll show you a drill, a couple of ways you can do drills to control ulna and radial. Okay, so I said I didn't want too much ulna or radial within the stroke. Um, putting board is a really good one. 
Um, the only negative of the putting ball would be if a golfer has, say, more shoulder turn or more shoulder tilt, um, so they don't particularly work the putter like perfectly on shaft plane, which is totally functional. Um, this makes you work it on shaft plane, but it's a good way to, to feel um, not too much change in ulnar and radial um, because these this wing and this wing will have to stay on the board. Um, and a really good way to use these is to actually not ride the board. It's to, to get as close as you can to the board and your setup and try and keep that distance the same. Um, so you're having to control it rather than um, you're just riding the board. So you do a few riding the board and then most of the time I would get the, the golfer to, to do it as close as they can to the board. And then another way is path training mats. Okay, so probably more of a 3D training aid, 2D. And you can put tees in um, and get the golfer to learn to control their path um, using the mat. And then I think this is the last preference I'm going to talk about. Um, this has a huge impact on, um, I say everything in the stroke, but especially how the, uh, the wrists move. Um, because the wrists, hands and wrists are such a, a huge um, source of, of speed and power, right? Um, so I would have a preference of having um, smoothly applied acceleration, right? Similar amount of acceleration in the golfer's backstroke and downstroke. So this is the acceleration that they're applying to the stroke. Um, and I want them to have pretty close to zero acceleration impact. Um, there are exceptions to this rule, as always, but I'd say most of the best putters are, are pretty close to this pattern. Um, enough energy going back so that they can kind of use the momentum of the swing rather than having to produce a sudden um, amount of acceleration to create speed. Um, already described that. So uh, here's a couple of, you know, less appropriate patterns. This is Capto data. Um, I use Hack and Capto alongside each other a lot. Um, and you can see here's impact. So this is no acceleration impact. You can see the golfer here, not as much speed going back. These putts all went the same length. Uh, not as much speed going back. So late at applying acceleration. You can see how much more acceleration they have to apply and how uh, much more dramatic this is. Okay, so they're having to produce that speed from somewhere, um, and this can can cause problems, um, you know, with hack motion related to the wrist pattern. Um, and the same here, we can see kind of extreme changes. It's not very smooth, acceleration at impact, sudden deceleration here. Um, so acceleration and how and where the golfer is accelerating is a is a big factor contributing to how the wrist will move in the stroke. Um, and just a simple drill that I get people to do um, to learn to accelerate the putter at the right times um, is just a multiple stroke drill. So you do practice strokes like that, and then you apply those practice strokes to the ball. Okay, so you can see me here just letting the putter swing, trying to do it as smoothly as possible and then just continue in the swing. Because what we actually want to happen, for me to bring that putter back down again to continue swinging, I have to decelerate in the follow through and that's what we want to see. So just a very simple drill um, to get golfers to understand where they need to be accelerating in the stroke and um, yeah, try and do that smoothly. If, if they do this drill and they, a lot of golfers will leave the ball short when they do this drill. Uh, they simply need to put more acceleration into their backstroke to create momentum for the swing. So they don't have enough momentum um, if that's what's happening. I think we're there. Yeah. And then the last one, just thought I'd describe one great way that I use hack motion um, in my coaching. For the most part, um, if I'm seeing wrist patterns that I, I don't like and I want to change, the 
biggest benefit to me of using hat motion is the biofeedback and the live wrist angles. So I can place an iPad right in front of the golfer um, and we can put thresholds in how we want to, the wrists to move. And if they're staying within those thresholds, then they're going to have audio feedback. And as soon as that um, feedback stops, then they know that they're not doing what they, what they need to do. Um, so I say that that's the biggest benefit that I find for using hack motion is the biofeedbacks uh, amazing for, for golfers to learn um, a better pattern. That's it.